Hello everyone. I'm back and I'm so glad to see you again and I have been so motivated to get certain areas uh, that were necessary to clean up ready so that I could come and sit with you for a while and I hope that you will get dressed up for this uh, session at, or if you're not if you're just resting that's fine too but I remember that the first thing I've told you to do over the years is to get dressed for the day for work and I am wearing my daisy dress. Uh, one of my grandchildren wanted to have some little event outdoors one summer and uh, she had gone to a great deal of uh, preparation and trouble and I asked her what it was and she said it was an, an outdoor living area. We were going to go out there for a few hours. She had some activities and some food and I said well I'm going to dress for it and since the daisies were all over the lawn at the time uh, we don't really have a lawn. Everything else has taken over. I decided to wear my daisy dress. I got this fabric many years ago at a fabric store and I liked it so much that I bought extra which I still have stashed away and I'm thinking that this girl probably will take it which will be fine. I won't live long enough to sew up some of that fabric so I'll let her have it and at last my mother said there's more where that came from. <laughs> so uh, today I'd like to welcome you to Homemakers Radio. I developed this little session so that you'd have something to listen to while you work. I know I often called uh, my daughter or my friends when I had something that I had to sort through or just uh, needed a, a voice, needed company. When uh, my children were here I would talk to them while I was working or they would come and read some of their lessons to me and lacking that I started calling them or calling someone else and I realized that I could put it on video and uh, make it into a broadcast and list someone could listen to it again if they needed to and it is for my descendants but if you didn't come I wouldn't be here because you're what motivates me all your interests and your comments and so I have developed a little script for today and I hope that you'll go and get dressed and I uh, would like to welcome you all to Homemakers Radio and hope that you get something done while you're here. I don't have, I don't think I have anything to show you much today because the idea was I didn't want to keep you here watching and looking at things on how to do things. You can go to YouTube and find uh, sometime when you're a little discouraged or you want some new ideas, you can find some wonderful videos on uh, how, you know, Clean With Me Day or um, people who are redoing their home, rearranging, or just uh, adding finishing touches. It's always encouraging to see what people do. And I uh, recently went, someone sent me a link to a YouTube vlog of a lady who just lives the slow life. And I really, really enjoyed that one day when I was feeling awfully tired and I just said, I just need to sit down and rest. and relax and lounge around and I uh, listened and watched that and it was very very encouraging and uh, goodness I can't think what her name was I think it was just called the slow life or living the slow life but before you go today to go about your business or to get ready I want to share with you my teacup I'm not bringing out the teacups as much because I'm a little bored with <laughs> showing the same ones over and over uh, but this was the closest I could get to this daisy dress. Be kind of nice, wouldn't it, to find teacups to match all the fabrics? Uh, and this is part of the fun of having a homemaking wardrobe. They're just uh, nice little cotton frocks, and uh, you wear them at home and and out too. They look just as decent anywhere else. Uh, they're no worse than anything that uh, the public wears, and. Uh, so it's kind of fun to match up the teacup for the day, get dressed up and say this is the teacup I'm going to use. Now there are some people who are so prejudiced against tea and the word tea that uh, they'll say they can't even stand the smell of tea and if I were to put a strawberry in a cup of hot water and let it steep and uh, just tell them to bring it up to their nose and smell it and just show them how delightful it is to drink something warm uh, they still wouldn't do it because they've got it in their head that they just can't stand tea but uh, when I say tea I'm not talking necessarily about um, 
Assam or any kind of uh, Ceylon or black tea or anything like that. It's, it's tisanes and herbals. And in Our Lady's Bible class every week, I try, uh, I talked about herbs of the Bible. And if on the web I read that you can make a tea of it, we always do a little sample sip of a tea and put some of it, some of the little sprig of whatever herb it is, whether it's uh, lemon balm or uh, tarragon or something that I read about that can be made into a tea, we'll do that and uh, they'll get to have the little sample uh, sip. And uh, so that's how we started out. And uh, I also wanted to show you one more thing and make another comment. I've shown you this before, but I've shown you uh, the Tea Time magazine and the Victoria magazine published by the same company, Hoffman Media, and told you that if you subscribe, they're only $5 an issue. If you buy them off the newsstand, or uh, at the grocery store or at the Walmart, um, they're ten dollars. Uh, well, you'll eventually have to buy something full price uh, just to get the little card that's in there. But I wanted to tell you something about them because my granddaughter gets this, and she's only fifteen, and she gets both of them. And uh, it just occurred to me to say that they are multi generational. These aren't for uh, only the vital. These aren't, uh, these just span all age groups, all generations. When my daughter was a little girl, she loved them. She always flipped through and found something that she liked in them. And invariably in uh, each of these, the staff takes a trip to some uh, historical place, whether it's in the States or overseas, and shows uh, history and architecture and things that you can use in your home school and for the boys too and uh, for instance this one on uh, Scotland I, th this is just fast becoming my favorite but uh, look at that and of course I look at all this stuff and I look down there at the basement and I look look at everything and I look at the grounds I look at the brickwork and the um, one of my hobbies look at the rocks and just the uh, the water the water where they were built by water and uh, so they are multi-generational. Everybody can love these books no matter how old you are. And they're not things that you collect and, and throw away. You don't start your fires with them. You save them as books. You put this one in your cookbook shelf with your other cooking books. And you put this one in your shelf with uh, valued books. And you don't uh, throw it away or toss it out in the trash or... Uh, and very rarely do I even give it away. If I want someone to have it, I'll just buy them a copy and give it to them. But uh, I'm very particular because sometimes I hear that people will read it and then throw it away. But it is uh, full of beautiful, beautiful things and never a discouraging word. Sometimes uh, you might find something you don't like in it, but in general, it's pretty good. So... Uh, and it's nice because it's a bright spot that, that comes in the mail. And last time we were talking here, um, I talked a little bit about housekeeping um, and, you know, just doing the areas that uh, were needed the most sanitation, the wet areas, the bathroom, the kitchen, the laundry room. And um, I have now completed the kitchen so I could come and sit down with you because after a while, uh, it starts to walk away, doesn't it? It starts to... <laughs> um, we do all of our... We do food preparation in there, rarely have uh, pre-made stuff, and so our kitchen is usually in use and very messy. Uh, so it's very labor-intensive. Labor but a couple of nights ago, I decided I'm, I'm just going to have to... Uh, leave some of it and and go to bed because I was extremely tired we've had very hot weather the sun is intensely bright as you can see coming through the window and I decided that I just needed to rest the, the heat was taking its toll on my energy and all night long I kept waking up in a start after having these little dreams about being in debt and it was such debt that uh, they would add on more uh, interest and I couldn't get out of it. I just couldn't pay it off. And uh, then I would find all different kinds of ways to uh, to get rid of it. And so finally I got up real early and cleaned the kitchen. 
<laughs> because it's like waking up to debt, you know, when, when you're not able to do it. It feels like that. I understand why sometimes we have to do it, but uh, it's like waking up to debt when you've had to go to bed or you got in too late or something and you can't really um, get a hold, get control of the housekeeping. Uh, it's, it's like waking up in debt because not only do you have to clean up the previous um, day's mess, but now you're starting to add on uh, the current day's mess. I'm just going to try and see if I heard a... Goodness, there's so much traffic around here. You wouldn't know I was living on farmland. They're so busy all the time. Um, now, uh, if you are homemaking and you're trying to homeschool, and I hope that you'll allow me to homeschool you, but you don't really need me because when you learn what it's really all about, it's all about learning uh, by yourself. And if you've ever had to repair something yourself or fix something yourself, then you've learned something. And if you've done it at home, then you have been home educated. So that's what home learning is and homeschooling is. You've done it at home. And uh, so to be really satisfied and uh, really happy uh, in this homemaking and homeschooling is you do uh, the most excellent job you can. It's, it's uh, relaxing. Uh, you can breathe easier, you can rest easier, and you won't have nightmares about being in debt. <laughs> and um, So if you learn at home, you're being homeschooled, and you become uh, self-taught and autodidactic, and you don't need a teacher. Now, many of you object to the word homeschooling, or you don't like um, the idea of uh, someone homeschooling you, but, you know... The media is homeschooling. If you're at home and you're listening to the media, you're reading it, they're homeschooling you. You're learning something from them. Uh, your friends are homeschooling you. Your uh, your um, peers, your the books and things you read, you're being homeschooled anyway. Um, so I don't know what the big uh, objection would be. However, you need to learn to be autodidactic, which means you are self-taught. You figure out ways to learn. You figure out how to do something so and you know some people just uh, misunderstand uh, or don't want to understand but uh, do you remember I forgot to look this up but there was a quote in the Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice where uh, Elizabeth had accused Darcy of being uh, one of his faults was being um, prideful and he accused her of uh, he says, well, yours is to willfully misunderstand. And we see that a lot, don't we, around us. And that's why I want to talk to you later when I talk about the people part. To be careful what you say. Be careful of the words of your mouth because some people grab on to something and, and go wild with it. Like uh, Emma said of Harriet, you get an idea and you run wild with it. Uh, so we, in a way, can... Um, can uh, temper people and and form their opinions uh, more accurately by keeping our mouth shut and by not not uh, elaborating on everything. And uh, you you'll notice this if you say uh, you want to be more friendly and more helpful, and someone admires something. Uh, maybe you sewed a dress, or maybe you uh, I don't know something rearranged something, or made something, or book. Uh, baked something and they'll compliment you and instead of just saying thank you you decide you have to add something else because it sounds a little bit less formal more um, more friendly and you will say I found that using this kind of flour helps or everything well all of a sudden they know everything about that kind of flour and all the objections they have to it and uh, so you've given them extra information to argue with if they're argumentative um, the best thing to do is what Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And I would add, let your thank you be thank you. <laughs> and don't add too much just trying to uh, put people at ease. Um, they can let, you know, it's like an, a book that you read. Uh, back in the olden days when we would read Anne of Green Gables, for instance, they were so wordy. A sentence could be as long as a paragraph and so many extra words in there. They left nothing to the imagination, although that book was all about uh, scope for the imagination. And so as uh, 
enter the 50s and sometimes a really good writer could write a book that would let you describe see the picture in your mind they wouldn't describe every little detail they would say something about a house or a room and uh, then you could you could see it yourself and so this is what we need to do with people uh, in in the home especially and now of course if you've got children there it's not good not to uh, describe things to them but they have to learn just to take it in stride and to uh, and to not be um, objectionable and contradictory and um, argumentative about everything. But we can prevent a lot of it by letting our responses be simple. And it's been said that children between the ages of 3 and 5 and uh, 13 and 15 just really need simple responses and not long, long explanations. For one thing, they can't always remember uh, what what you're explaining to them it has to be very simple. And home, uh, the house and home, is where you practice overcoming a lot of um, character problems. And when you get to a, a point where uh, some people are just not getting along very well in the house, it doesn't mean, uh, well, they're unhappy here. Let's just let them go and live with grandma. Let's let them go to aunt so-and-so's place. Uh, because being unhappy is not a reason to leave home because there's your training ground. You need to learn uh, how to get along with people and parents need to quietly take a child aside and say uh, this is how you should answer her or answer him and this is what you should say and that uh, what you did say triggered them and uh, never uh, I also don't believe that it's wise to correct a child in front of the other children or humiliate them in front of people uh, with sharp sharpness and correction. That should also be done in private if possible. I know that it isn't always, but sometimes people, and even adults, even a husband or wife, uh, they don't want to endure the hardship of learning and overcoming, so they feel like... Uh, they're not happy so the idea is just to leave well that's not going to solve anything because they'll just find the next place uh, just just as difficult because what they're over trying to overcome is not uh, finding a place where they're going to be happy but they have not overcome uh, the learning uh, of character or overcoming some of the things and that's what the home is is the home is the training ground for all that and even parents they're still growing they're still we're still learning and um, so we're not often conscious of how much fulfillment and learning and creativity and spiritual growth that the home offers uh, and always trying to go somewhere out there or get something that uh, will make us happier at home but I think putting yourself into it and um, not going to bed in debt <laughs> can help a lot in the happiness at home and the sense of well-being. I don't know why this is and it seems real um, materialistic but to have everything in order uh, makes our makes our minds less jumbled and um, I once heard a phrase sloppy living leads to sloppy thinking and I believe it because I often have those moments and I'm thinking, oh, I'm just going crazy. But once something is put back to order, um, I feel balanced. Now, today I'd like to talk to you about a couple of words since this, and this isn't just about homemaking, but it's just a time where you can go about your business at home. You can even uh, sweep and you can, there are many things you can do that uh, enable you to listen at the same time. And I wish I had found a poem by Elizabeth Sangster that I was going to read to you, but I did bring her book along. And, uh, of course, all of this is about the home. Uh, you can go to some other sites, especially YouTube, to learn more about household hints and cleaning and how to do things, um, food preparation, that sort of thing. So I decided that you needed to learn two words, maybe three. Okay, so today... Uh, I'm going to teach you uh, the words bellwether. Bellwether. And it's 
W E T H E R, not weather like in the weather or weather like weather or not. So bell weather was apparently the bell on, and I should know I'm out in sheep country here in Oregon. Um, is the sheep is the bell put on the lead sheep so that uh, you could determine where where it was and where the rest of the flock was, and it has been used as an expression to indicate uh, the current um, opinion or situation or where people are or uh, what the mood is of people in politics. So it's called bellwether where you judge uh, how things are going by certain states and they're called bellwether states. So you can uh, you could just uh, become autodidactic and look that up a little bit more. Keep yourself, I, I wish years ago I had found a neat little tidy notebook and written things like this down and then years later maybe one of my descendants could look through this book and see what I was thinking as I wrote things like this. It doesn't have to be a notebook with a particular subject. It can just be everything. It can have your list in it, can have your schedule in it, and then it can have things you've heard or reminders or things that you like, uh, like words. So here's another one and it's called vapid, V-A-P-I-D, and it means useless talking, empty, shallow talking, and uh, it means bland, not interesting, and, and uh, it includes insipid, which means the same thing. So you see vapid and insipid and you kind of see the P-I-D at the end of each word, vapid, insipid. So speak carefully uh, and be careful what you tell people. Think carefully. Will it lead them to uh, correct you, object, contradict, or criticize? You know, uh, there are some people that you shouldn't probably uh, converse with. You should limit how much you converse with. And I remember somebody telling me, um, that she did not, that she kind of had had um, fell, fallen out of communication with a couple of people because she couldn't seem to get uh, a pleasant uh, exchange. Hello, how are you? And and uh, a pleasant exchange with this person without that person uh, constantly correcting her, jumping. I mean, jumpy, jumping to conclusions, jumping. Uh, kind of jumping on top of her statements before they were even finished and so she said I had to I had to just um, limit my uh, communication with her because even with uh, text which you think is going to be easier they're good at they're good at sending back a hasty sharp reply that can devastate you and so uh, want to keep your keep your, your keep yourself encouraged keep a sense of well-being then you need to stay away from the things that uh, that reject you and you don't have to announce to them I can't talk to you anymore I'm I'm cutting you off just start um, tapering it off and being real busy and not uh, spending much time with it but you don't have to announce it you know that just causes more trouble um, but just limiting that, remember Jesus told the disciples that when after he'd given them the gospel commission, he said, if you go somewhere and they don't receive you, then go somewhere else. <laughs> he said, shake the dust off your feet. And that was an expression that meant I, I'm not going to um, meddle with you anymore. And so one of the reasons he said that, from what I can see, is he knew the value of keeping encouraged and he knew how debilitating it would be if they were run down, criticized, uh, railed against, and constantly attacked and argued with too much uh, because then they would uh, be discouraged and uh, you need to have some success. So remember that and uh, so now, yesterday, last time I talked to you, day before, or the re recent um, broadcast, I talked to you about the manners of speaking, uh, of answering, of speaking when spoken to. Now, when you were little, those of you who are vital, weren't you told to speak when spoken to, except with strangers? Don't talk to strangers. But with other people, speak when spoken to. People that you know, people that 
uh, you you are safe with, um, but don't talk to strangers. So speak when spoken to. I think that's a good thing, and the Bible talks about being courteous. So speak when spoken to is a very good uh, thing to remember. And I want to um, read from that scripture we that I am pounding to death. And it's Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith virtue and to your virtue with knowledge and, and add uh, to knowledge self-control. And it goes on and lists about 10 things that you need uh, to keep you f- uh, being effective and fruitful. And uh, so the first thing was... Um, add to your faith and why does it come in that order and I explained in the previous video that these this is a, an equation that has to be done in the order in which it's written it's not like our addition problems where you could switch the numbers around and still come out with the same answer and I mentioned also in the previous video about uh, a recipe and how you can't just dump all the ingredients in there they have to be added a certain way or they won't blend very well and it won't turn out very well. So uh, when it says uh, add to your faith, well why would it put faith first? Because faith is belief and uh, belief is described all through the New Testament as believing in something even though you haven't actually seen it and uh, remember uh, when Thomas touched the scar of Jesus he said blessed are you Thomas for you have seen and believed but blessed are those who have not seen and still believe so uh, belief faith is belief and so you have to have that first as a foundation otherwise what's the point of uh, the practice of goodness knowledge self-control steadfastness etc if it doesn't have the good foundation of belief. Think about that a little bit. And you know what we're going to do in our ladies Bible class every week is now we're ready. Since I've made all these comparisons, I'm going to now go through and have them look up the words and we'll look up faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, etc and we will look those up and study those words. I could create a college semester out of this, um, but I won't, I won't do that to you. And now I want to see. Oh, yes. I have this book called Winsome Womanhood by Margaret Sangster, written in 1900. You can go to um, Thrift Books and get this, thriftbooks.com. The reason I use Thrift Books, they're cheaper and you can um, get a free book once in a while when you after you've bought a few and you can buy new ones as well as used ones thriftbooks.com and uh, you can get different editions but this was revised and expanded by Shelley Noonan and she's made it into a journal with uh, little work pages and uh, you know things like this so if you would like to have that that's okay uh, I just wanted a copy of it to see what she said and so I want to read about her and it's too bad that she, her name is so close to Margaret Sanger who was the author of uh, who was the promoter of abortion in the United States but this is Margaret Elizabeth Sangster and she had some wonderful poetry and I hope that I can find it and post it on the page on which this is embedded if you're new here please go to the page that I have linked to in the description box here on YouTube on the channel and just go over there to that page then click on the video and you'll see everything else that goes with it okay uh, because this is just a little bit this is just something that I created to go on my my pages so so let's see what she says about this woman printed in 1900 and here it is Margaret Elizabeth Sangster was um, she was born February 22 1838 
in New York, and she died June 3, 1912, in New Jersey. Margaret Elizabeth Sangster was, from an early age, a voracious reader. Writing became a natural event for her because of this early passion. Her first... Just checking my, um, my sound here, making sure it's okay. Her first published story... Little Janie, 1855, won her an appointment to write a hundred children's stories. She married George Sangster in 1858 and paused in her writing career, starting again in 1871 after his death. So, throughout her career, she continued to write articles, essays, and letters reflecting her belief that she had a mission to girlhood to be a Christian leader to young women. She wrote numerous books, including an autobiography, From My Youth Up, Personal Reminiscence, 1909, published in 1909. Her writings were enjoyed for their pious, cheerful, and sentimental flavor. The practical application, common sense, and godly wisdom makes her, her books timeless. And as I read through this, I just feel so sorry that it wasn't available. Now look, it was published in 1900. But why wasn't it in the public schools in the 1950s when I was a girl and I needed it? I wanted, I just desperately could have used something like this because uh, when, as I read it to you, you'll see why. But, you know, it's never too late. Uh, we can be girls and we can, we can still read it. So, so I'll read a little bit of it to you to tell you why I, I just feel so sad because I didn't get it. And I don't even think my daughter had a chance to have it because it was only recently the homeschoolers have done a good job of digging up these old books and having them reprinted. Uh, remember the Dover book I read to you yesterday uh, about the weather. Um, that's one you could write to this Dover catalog and you could show them a book you wanted reprinted and they would find it somewhere and reprint it on their in their company and uh, make it available. And that's where a lot of those books came from. And so this is one that uh, was unearthed by a homeschooler, homeschool teacher. And uh, it's really, is really quite good. Um, of course, you know, you always have to be careful uh, to match it up with your own beliefs. And I want to read this section here about a girl admitting you to her room. A room of her very own should be a young girl's retreat. Here she may enjoy the half hours for devotion which tend to the soul's growth and may read and study and entertain her friends. In this her den, her bower, her nook, her special fancies may be indulged and her individuality find fit expression. If a girl admit me to her room, I need no other interpreter of her character. Her daintiness, her delicacy, her fondness for art, her little fads and caprices here are revealed. Does she care for athletics? Her room tells the story, her guitar and her flute, her books on her bedside table and her closet. Explain her, for wherever we live we set our seal, and this unconsciously. The untidy girl keeps her room in chaos and confusion. It looks as if swept by a small tornado. If you have a problem with that, then you can look up a lot of sites that tell you how to get out of these messes, and everybody develops a kind of system to do it. Um, An orderly girl has a place for each belonging and puts it there without effort and without fuss. As for the room itself, it may be plain to bear or beautifully luxurious. A cell or a shrine, it owes its grace or lack of charm more to its occupant than to the paper and paint, its bed and dresser, its rug and chairs. A girl's room is as much an expression of herself as her mother's house is an expression of herself. We need not resign our rights to beautiful surroundings because we must keep a strict rein upon expenditure and have an eye to ways and means. Unless a young woman learns early to make the most of a little in hand, she will never be successful when she has something large in her stewardship. I've heard many a young woman say they wish that they had uh, 
paid more attention to taking care of their own room before they got married because the uh, responsibility got larger. Um, they almost felt uh, that they didn't know what to do with everything and it would have been better to have learned uh, while they were still in their own room. And uh, so I just re thought I'd read that little little part to you. So I'll read a little bit more about this. This was from a chapter uh, about a girl of 15. A young girl ought not to be reproved in public nor held up to ridicule in front of others. Expect from her the performance of her regular daily duties in a task work of school and the routine of the home, but include her in the simple household pleasures. Above all, surround her with the protection of considerate politeness. If she is brusque and short with you, be the more civil to her. If she is willful, treat her with gentleness. If she is disturbed and disquieted, find out the reason. Be true to her and expect from her the truth. Teach her now how to honor and care for her body and how to conserve her health. And, you know, young girls have so much energy, they're likely just to run themselves ragged. And they become so used to filling the day with uh, work and accomplishment that uh, you've got to be careful because uh, somebody finds out your daughter can do something or you can do something and they want you they want to hire you to do it uh, or they want you to help them and uh, can can use her and wear her out teach her now how to honor and care for her body and how to conserve her health and above all things love her let her know and feel that she is treasured for who she is and let this be her secret of strength, that she is not her own, but bought with a price by the precious blood of Christ. Shall she may sing for him, or work for him, and live for him, because her life is his, and he abides in her soul as in a temple. So here was a description of a girl from some artist, I believe. Her form was graceful as a flower stem, her face as bright as the flower itself. She flashed into a room caroling like a bird, like a burst of sunshine, like a hillside breeze. There was joy in her face, joy in her words, joy in her ways. Enjoy your girl of fifteen. She makes the world a brighter place where the brook and the river meet. And uh, sometime I'd like to read the poem by William Wordsworth. Um, she was a phantom of delight when she, first she gleamed upon my sight and I wanted to explain that to you because a lot of people in this era totally misjudge and understand that poem and draw terrible conclusions about women of the past, women of the Victorian era and uh, say that they were vapid <laughs> and so I wanted to read that to you sometime and explain it. I don't have it with me. I have memorized some of it and I want to uh, read to you about Jane Austen's. I know a lot of you are interested in the Jane Austen books. Now, I never could make head nor tail of those books. It's another one of those wordy eras where the author um, spoke a lot of words. But when I saw, I finally got it sorted out when I saw the movies that came out in the 1990s, 1995 and 1996. And um, there was Emma, Pride and Prejudice, and Sense and Sensibility. Well, then it started to make sense to me. And now I'm enjoying reading it all because I know what's going on. And so if you don't have those, uh, it's the same with Wives and Daughters. If you can get the DVD set, uh, they are very relaxing to watch. And you can figure out what's going on there. And I would like to explain Wives and Daughters uh, before I read a little bit out of it today, if I have time. But today... I am going to read about Jane Austen's world and letter writing in Jane Austen's time. And the letters I'm going to describe to you, I have seen these. I was at the end of this era where uh, the onion skin paper that was written on for writing overseas or writing airmail was real lightweight. It was almost a see-through pa tracing paper and uh, my mother had a tablet of it and it was considered very valuable so of course she didn't let us use it but uh, letters that came that were onion skin were written across 
And then uh, to save uh, the weight of adding another sheet of paper, they were written diagonally across those words or across the other way. Uh, and you, you could actually read it, but that was how they saved space. I have probably shown this on a previous post many years ago, but on this site, it's called janeaustinsworld.com, and the, the title of the article is Letter Writing in Jane Austen's Time. This is what the... Um, this is what the header looks like. So you'll recognize this lady here because she writes a lot about Jane Austen. That's what her header looks like. So I've seen her a lot. And so she's written called Letter Writing in Jane Austen's Time. During Jane Austen's time, letters, and I want to remind you too with letters, uh, what I have done, uh, because I want the uh, descendants to write to me, is when they're here, I I send them home with an envelope and uh, the stamp, the self address and paper, and uh, share with them how to write to me. Or I have them leave me uh, a note. During Jane Austen's time, letters were written on sheet of paper that were folded and sealed, as in this sample. Yes, you would write on it and then fold it up, and the back side you could not, um, there was nothing on that, so you could just seal it. It's just the paper was folded and, and uh, like a sticker on it. The recipient of the letter had to pay for the delivery. Therefore, the fewer pages that were used, the less expensive the cost, since the fee was based on the size of a letter and the distance it traveled. Envelopes were not used at that time. I believe it was the French who invented the envelope to keep or envelope to keep uh, the privacy of a letter. They would have added an additional sheet of paper and cost more for the recipient. To keep the letter affordable, people also wrote in a cross letter style as shown below. So I'll just show that to you. If you can, goodness, if you can see it. Um, and you can see them writing back and forth. But actually, you could still read it. Handmade papers were made in molds, hence one could easily observe the paper marks and ribbing from the parallel wires of the mold. Have you ever made paper? That might be a good project uh, to do with uh, grandchildren, although it's kind of messy, but I think you can get kits at Hobby Lobby to make it easier for you with all the instructions. Often these laid papers also bore distinctive watermarks. Double click on the image below to see the distinctive uh, markings up close. Yeah, they'd have a, it, it would have like a seal on it that looked like a, when you cancel the stamp, it, it's a circle with a bell in the middle or something like that. I can't really show that to you. Writing implements included the quill pen, an inkstand filled with ink, pen, knife, and sometimes a writing box. But I remember the pen, it wasn't, uh, it didn't have a quill on it, but a, it just had a handle. But I remember the dip pens before the uh, ballpoint pen became acceptable in school uh, back in the early 50s we were still using the dip pen and the ballpoint pen was somewhat the teachers were reluctant to accept it because they made you it made you write so fast that you couldn't be careful with your lettering it's so true isn't it I wish I had uh, kept with something like the the dip pen or the um, fountain pen uh, makes you it makes you write more slowly. Roller blotters made their appearance during the 19th century. Before this time, writers dried wet ink by sprinkling grains of sand over the words. Now, if you will watch the 1990s movie um, Persuasion, you'll see somebody in that, and I believe it's Captain Wentworth. Is it? who's writing a letter and uh, it shows him sprinkling salt on it. So they were quite accurate in that movie. Creating quill pens was an art since the nib had to be carefully cut with a knife so that the hollow core would hold just the amount of ink and release it with steady pressure. Yes, it had a little uh, split in the nib, in the pen, and you dip it. You would dip it in the ink. We didn't have real ink. like We'd, We would water down paint or something like that. Um, poster paint and uh, you dip it in and then that little um, 
that little piece of liquid would hang there underneath in the little hollow of the pin and get used up as you wrote and as you pressed down it would go down that little uh, that little split hole there if the writer wrote for any length of time fingers on the writing hand will often become ink stained quill pens most commonly obtained from the wing feathers of a goose had to be sharpened often with a pen knife the average quill pen lasted only a week before it was discarded after folding the paper, a sender would seal the letter with a custom wax seal stamp that in some instances bore the family crest of the sender's initials. The address on the outside remained simple, directing the bearer of the letter to the city or town street and name of receiver. I can remember letters that were sent that just had the person's name and the, and the town they lived in before it got so complicated. And um, so I'd encourage you to go this, and I will leave a link for you about this. And now I'm going to read to you a little bit uh, from Brian Koslowski's book, uh, The Jane Austen Diet. Now, a lot of you have bought this, and I had it sitting here for quite a while, and I didn't even open it. And then one day I decided I was going to read it aloud to myself, and I found that I understood it better, and it was more interesting. It got into my brain in a different way, and... I enjoyed it more reading it aloud so that's why I'm reading it to you this is called an interval of meditation sometimes Austin heroines have to go off the mental grid to process those shocking articles of news that seem to pummel them daily and uh, there was a uh, it was talking about how they had to, and I may have read this to you before, how they had to temper and balance getting away on their own to social life. They didn't want to be alone too much, but they also didn't want too much uh, commotion in their lives, and they had to go away and be quiet and think. Jane Austen's novels aren't too far removed from a modern sitcom. Somebody's always coming or going, turning up at the back door, popping in for a quick chat, inviting you on a walk, squeezing you for gossip, a cup of tea, or an invite to a ball. And I wanted to read to you about tea here. Um, and she, there's, he has a chapter on Jane Austen and tea. Let's start with the go-to beverage the drink all heroines in Jane Austen's book should prefer. Find the words drink or drinking in a Jane Austen sentence, and you're almost guaranteed to find a nice cup of tea at the end of it. Emma alone has 15 tea references. Mansfield Park has eight. Coffee? Nah. Cocoa? Nope. I'm much obliged to you, but I'd rather prefer tea. It all seems rather quaint and cutesy to us. Ah, tea with Jane Austen. Warm fuzzies emanate from the very phrase. But there's more to Jane's offer of tea than a few crocheted doilies and pinky up fingers. In fact, Austen's promotion of tea was practically edgy by Regency Health Standard. And... It talked about how people were suspicious of it at first and thought that it would uh, cause all kinds of trouble. And, uh, but how it, that it, it stayed. And Though despite not having any scientific way of knowing if this exotic brew was healthy or not, Jane spoke up for tea with the tree-stumping passion of a Lorax. Even today, there are few greater tributes to drinking tea than those found in Jane's novels. Perhaps you would like some tea. Every smart heroine confidently answers yes. The heroine of Sanditon even makes a bold prediction that one day it will be the simplest thing in the world to prove the effect tea has on the body by those who have studied tea scientifically and thoroughly understand all the possibilities of their action on each other. Meanwhile, Austin remains, reminds her characters to drink up. You must drink tea. It is the closest Jane gets to issuing a dietary command. Turns out she was brilliantly correct. And then he goes on in this chapter to show uh, all the benefits that tea has come to have that people have uh, found out. We'll read more about that later because I only have 10 more minutes and I want to read to you out of Wives and Daughters if I, if I get a chance. But first, I, and, and the issue that I'm using is by Wordsworth Editions. I like uh, their books. I get them off of Thrift Books and you can get them for, free, uh, for brand new also. Um, first of all, you're introduced to Molly. She's sitting under a tree. She's a little girl. She's fallen asleep at a party. 
uh, at uh, Lady and Lord Cumnor's mansion or estate, which they had every year for uh, for children, and uh, then uh, shows that her father has been widowed and that she and he have uh, come to rely on each other a great deal, and. Uh, his, her father is a country doctor in Scotland, and uh, he, as she grows older, of course, he's hired a young man to work in his uh, pharmacy that's in his house. Uh, so he was he was kind of part allopathic and part um, naturopathic. And uh, so in order to uh, give his daughter something to do and somewhere to go and kind of protect her too from the attentions of all these young men he sends her to work for to help Mrs. Hamley at Hamley Hall who are kind of uh, neighborhood farmers of his and uh, they have two sons Roger Hamley who's really into nature studies and uh, Osborne who's the poet and the writer and who's been to school and uh, been to college and uh, so I'm at the point, part here where the father, uh, Mr. Gibson, realizes that he probably needs to have a wife now because uh, he's been a widow a long time and Molly is 17 and he knows that she, he's going to need some help. So he finds, uh, he's recommended uh, to a widow uh, who also has a daughter and he has just told Molly that he got himself engaged to her and uh, she breaks down and cries. She's on a, a kind of a park bench at uh, the Hamley residence where she's helping Mrs. Hamley and one of the sons, Roger, who's come in from fishing and caught a bunch of stuff um, to study, uh, finds her weeping on this bench and it says uh, he, he always came home for lunch because of his mother even though he didn't think much of it for some reason didn't want to stop for lunch but he knew his mother would be there and she'd want him to talk to her. He did not see Molly as he crossed the terrace walk on his way homewards. He had gone about 20 yards along the small wood path at right angles to the terrace when looking among the grass and wild plants under the trees he spied out one which was rare, one which he had been long wishing to find in flower and saw it at last with those bright keen eyes of his. Down went his net, skillfully twisted, so as to retain its contents, while it lay amid the herbage, and he himself went with light and well-planted footsteps in search of the treasure. He was so great a lover of nature that without any thought but habitually, he always avoided treading unnecessarily on any plant. Who knew what long oversought growth or insect might develop itself in that which now appeared to be insignificant. His steps led him in the direction of the ash tree seat, much less screened from observation on this side than on the terrace. He stopped. He saw a light-colored dress on the ground, somebody half lying on the seat. You've seen these old paintings from the 17 and 1800s of ladies lounging on a lawn chair, a lawn seat, with a long dress on. Very pretty. So still just then, he wondered if the person who was, whoever it was, had fallen ill or fainted. He paused to watch. In a minute or two, the sobs broke out again, the words. It was Miss Gibson carrying uh, on, crying in a broken voice. Oh, Papa, Papa, if you would only come back. For a minute or two, he thought it would be kinder just to leave her fancying herself unobserved. He had even made a retrograde step or two on tiptoe, but then he heard the miserable sobbing again. It was further than his mother could walk, or else be the sorrow what it would. She was the natural comforter of this girl, her visitor. However, whether it was right or wrong, delicate or obtrusive, when he heard the sad voice talking again in such tones of uncomforted, lonely misery, he turned back and went to the green tent under the ash tree. She started up when he came thus close to her. She tried to check her sobs and instinctively smoothed her wet, tangled hair back with her hands. He looked down upon her with grave, kind sympathy, but he did not know exactly what to say. Well, haven't we all been there? It's always... Uh, I've never been in, uh, comfortable with um, 
it just never feels adequate to extend sympathy. It just never quite enough. Uh, and I've never ever felt at ease with it. He looked down upon her with grave, kind sympathy, but he did not know what to say. Is it lunchtime? said she, trying to believe that he did not see the traces of tears, uh, that he had not seen her sobbing her heart out there. Uh, I don't know. I was going home to lunch, but, but you must let me say it. I couldn't go on when I saw your distress. Has anything happened? Anything in which I may help you? I mean, uh, for of course, I have no right to make the inquiry. If it is anything private, anything of a private sorrow in which I can be of no use. She had exhausted herself so much with crying that she felt as if she could neither stand nor walk just yet. She sat down on the seat and sighed and turned so pale she thought she was going to faint. Wait a moment, said he quite unnecessarily, for she could not have stirred, and he was off like a shot to some spring of water that he knew of in the wood, and in a minute or two he returned with careful steps, bringing a little in a broad green leaf, turned into an impromptu cup. Little as it was, it did her good. That was some of the fun things that the uh, descendants are doing with me. They like these big laurel leaves, and they will use them for for artwork and for uh, for uh, for fans and and to carry water in. It's very. Um, it's always a delight to see the creativeness there. Thank you, she said. I can walk back now in a short time. Don't stop. You must let me, said he. My mother wouldn't like me to leave you to come home alone while you are so faint. So they remained in silence for a little while, breaking off and examining one or two abnormal leaves of the ash tree, partly from the custom of his nature, partly to give her time to recover. Papa is going to be married again, she said at length. She could not have said why she told him this. An instant before she spoke, she had no intention of doing so. He dropped the leaf he held in his hand, turned around, and looked at her. Her purr, wistful eyes were filling with tears as they met his with a dumb appeal for sympathy. Her look was as much more eloquent than her words. There was a momentary pause before he replied, and then it was more because he felt that he must say something than that he was in any doubt as to the answer to the question he asked. You're sorry for it? She did not take her eyes from his, as her quivering lips formed the word yes. Though her voice made no sound, she was silent again now, looking at the ground, kicking softly at a loose pebble uh, with his foot. His thoughts did not come readily to the surface in the shape of words, nor was he apt at giving comfort till he saw his way clear to the real source from which consolation must come. At last he spoke, almost as if he was reasoning out the answer with himself. It seems as if there might be cases where, setting the question of love entirely on one side, it must be almost a duty to find someone to be a substitute for the mother, I can believe, said he, that... This step must be greatly for your father's happiness. It may relieve him from many cares and may give him a pleasant companion. He had me. You don't know what we were to each other. At least what he was to me, she added humbly. This is where the script and the movie follows exactly. Still, he must have thought it for the best or he wouldn't have done it. He may have thought it was the best for your sake even more than for his own. That's what they tried to convince me of. Roger began kicking the pebble again. He had not got hold of the right end of the clue. Suddenly, he looked up. I want to tell you of a girl I know. Her mother died when she was about sixteen, the eldest of a large family. From that time, all through the bloom of her youth, she gave herself to, up to her father for his comfort, afterwards a friend and secretary. He was a man with a great deal of business on hand and often came home uh, to set afresh to preparations for the next day's work. Harriet, his daughter, was always there, ready to help. It went on for eight or ten years this way, and then her father married again, again, a woman not many years older than Harriet herself. Well, they are just the happiest set of people I know. You wouldn't have thought it likely, would you? She was listening, but she had no heart to say anything. Yet she was interested in this little story of Harriet, a girl who had been so much to her father in the early youth. How was it? she sighed out at last. 
Well, Harriet thought her father's happiness thought of her father's happiness before she thought of her own, Roger answered. So I'm going to stop there and we'll continue at another time. And I hope that this has uh, been something worth listening to while you work. And I know some of you just fell asleep, but still, that's good too. And um, so thank you so much for coming. It's such an honor that you would even come and listen here. And um, so I hope that I can come more often. And I also want to thank you for those of you that uh, gone to the trouble to stop and leave a comment that's helpful too and those of you that would that send emails to me I appreciate that a lot and uh, that's what gives me uh, any motivation to go on and choose different subjects to talk about while you work so ladies I want to remind you stay close to Christ and we'll we'll do some more of the people stuff uh, another time I didn't really get into it very much this time but I hope to do more later I'll talk to you later. Bye.